Good afternoon. I'm Craig Shepard, and I'm coming to you from my house here in the very northeastern corner of Seattle on an overcast afternoon, Sunday, October 4th, 2020. We are here today to talk about, and I will perform, Opus 109, which is one of Beethoven's greatest piano works, one of our favorite works amongst the pianists. It was written in 1820. It was published in 1821. The whole manner in which it came about was very roundabout. There were lots of back and forths between publishers and uh, people who were correcting the, the proofs. And there are a few um, sources for this. Basically, the manuscript is what we rely on. Um, there are a couple of differences, and I'll show those later, but uh, it's basically what we do. It is. Uh, it was um, dedicated to Maximilian Brentano, who was the daughter of Antonia Brentano, who we think was the immortal beloved, of the famous letter that Beethoven wrote, and nobody could figure out who, who she was. Um, Maximilian herself was a budding uh, amateur pianist, and Beethoven was very fond of her. The Opus 109 has a few distinctive features, and we'll point these out now, as well as what I'm going to do is also to show you a little bit why and how I think of things as I've performed the work for 50 years, in fact, a little bit more. So let's start. <clears throat> First of all, you notice it begins on, on, on a G sharp. It doesn't begin on the E. Then, then it goes down by thirds. A common thing in Beethoven. And he has only a, oh, here's another thing. He outlines an octave, a descending octave. And that's another thing throughout the whole piece. Um, sometimes he does it in ascending octave, like the opening of Da in, in the third movement. But we have a descending octave in, in, in the um, second movement, the prestissimo, and you go yop, bop, bop, bop. in the middle of the movement, another descending octave. Uh, all of these things come about. The, uh, there's a lot to be said, and we won't go into this, about the uh, going up the third and down the fourth. The next thing you notice right away on the second, uh, on the second line, and something which bothered me when I was a kid and I came to this, is how he suddenly goes, he breaks up a gorgeous eight-bar phrase by suddenly bringing in the second subject, the second, and in a diminished chord. The other thing you notice is all of the, the piano, and then crescendo, forte, piano, crescendo, uh, piano. <laughs> you think, my God, forte, piano, forte, piano. It drives you nuts at first. But you have to do, you have to try to do what Beethoven says. Then you get to this part. two bars. Many of my colleagues, or many of our colleagues, play these out of tempo. I believe we should try to maintain the tempo, because here, <laughs> there you can do what you want. It's more of a cadenza. In the development, the, um, the rise, it goes up in steps. here to the top. What do we see in the score? We see sforzato piano, not sforzato forte. This leads me to believe that we should probably pull back there. It's, it's a very much against what we feel. We feel we should go. Keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Beethoven somehow doesn't want that in my estimation. I don't hear this too often. You know this. Uh, in fact, for me, that's almost the low point, not the high point, because there, that's a, 
that's the real crescendo into the into the recapitulation. And then again we have the interrupted by the the second uh, the B theme again uh, a four steps higher. And now the other thing is when we get to the end. Here's your coda. Beethoven says tempo one. Well, forgive me, Beethoven, but somehow in my many years of playing this, I feel that this particular section has the right to be more relaxed than that, slightly under tempo, because you can hear more that way. Many of my colleagues disagree, but this is, this is how I've arrived at it. And I hope that you'll agree with me after hearing me play it. Okay, we have, we've talked about the opening of the pressed sword. Oh, here's another thing. This last chord. First of all, as I say to my students on penalty of death, if they don't observe that pedal marking, which goes into the, into the second movement, but more importantly is this G sharp going into the G natural, which, you know, so when you balance the chord, that needs to be heard at all. You know, that's for me a given. Um, I think this is all pretty straightforward until we get to this wonderful Bach. <laughs> C major. Where does that come from? Well, do you remember in the first movement? We have C major already given. Beethoven, when he does things in one movement, he'll carry it over into another. There's a brief moment in the, in the last movement, but it's really, in my view, not that necessary. Um, but we do have all this counterpoint. Beethoven, in his uh, love of Bach, as everybody did, and, and later on he, as you know, the fugue in Opus 110, the fugue in Opus 106, <laughs> he, he did his homework and it came out pretty well. Um, now we have the last movement. It's interesting because Beethoven says, Beethoven says in two languages, he gives you an, an indications in German and in, uh, in uh, Italian, he does this, by the way, also in Opus 101, and I believe in Opus 90, but whatever. Gesang voll mit innigster Empfindung. This means singing uh, with the deepest feeling. And then, but the, 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 the indication in Italian, andante molto cantabile et espressivo. Uh, 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 andante, not too slow, by the way. Many people play this in adagio. It's an andante. However, when it says molto cantabile and espressivo, this gives us a little room, maybe not to be quite such a fast andante. Who knows? Who knows? But you, you see that the German and the Italian are telling you two different things. My estimation is that Beethoven didn't want to write too long in either language, so he was able to spell out more instructions by using the two languages. And another thing is that in his manuscript, it doesn't say Gesang voll, singing, it says Gesang, and that means a song. So in fact, he means this probably just to be a song, you know. And many people have postulated this is like a saraband because it's in three and it's slow. However, I don't see that the second beat is, is, is usually emphasized as would be in a saraband. I just think it's a song in three. In fact, it could even be a very slow waltz. <laughs> anyway, the, and, and another thing is that the piece, the first note is again like the opening is on a third, the G sharp, and every one of these variations that follow, including from this theme, finish on the G sharp, every single one of them. The, the first variation, second variation, there you go. 
And that goes ataka into a yuk. One of my favorite variations. I'm going to do a little aside now. I know this is getting long, but when, when I first learned this, and I brought this to my teacher in New York, who was Ilona Kabosh, and I showed her, I played all of this. Thumbs. Thumb, 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 thumb. At first she didn't like it. She, she, then she thought, okay, if, you, if, it, if it works, do it. It's a little risky, but the reason I wanted to do that was to give an evenness in the sound. I don't use all thumbs, by the way, now. I, I do a more conventional fingering. So, this is, oh, this wonderful variation. And basically, that's the last note of the, of the fourth variation, of the third variation, sorry. But he, and then suddenly he elides it. He's, the only time he does this. So the fourth variation. Uh, again, the markings in German and, and, and Italian are slightly different. Now, number five. It says allegro ma non troppo. Not too much. I think, again, many people play this too fast. I hear, you know. It, it doesn't do it for me. <laughs> I think this is sort of a stomp. It needs more heaviness. Now, coming to the last variation, we know this goes from quarter notes with the theme, and then eight, eighth notes to triplets. To, then to, to, uh, to sextuplets. And then, if, and then to uh, 30 second notes. And then finally to a trill. Da, 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 da. You know, it's uh, amazing construction, really. It, um, and I think more or less that is, that is it. I could go a lot deeper into it, but I think I've already probably done plenty and I think we should play now. So here is Opus 109, uncut.
Thank you for listening. Thank you for putting up with my glasses that were slipping. And for the few mistakes that I made, hopefully they weren't too many. <laughs>